I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit here once again in my chair of infinite knowledge and at my desk of discretion and answer your questions about the Second World War. Remember, Time Ghost Army members get prioritized or even guaranteed answers in this series. Our first question comes from Army member Low Baned. Low Baned? Yeah, Low Baned asks, Hey there, Indian team, I have a question for Out of the Foxholes. I've recently watched Fury because it was praised across all of the internet as a historically accurate and good movie, but I could not manage to finish it because as the film goes on, it becomes more obvious this is just uh, war pornography and not a movie which retells history. This becomes especially obvious in the scene where War Daddy forces his new recruit to shoot a POW, which is obviously a war crime, which seemed to be glorified by the movie. Did such war crimes really occur in the American army? And if, were they ever published after the war? Love the show and much love from Little Austria. Little Austria. Okay. The Americans, the Allies as a whole, yeah, they, they also committed war crimes throughout this conflict. We have seen this, whether on a close personal scale or something like the Iranian famine that was essentially caused by the British, Americans, and Soviets by neglect. Sparty fairly recently made a video where he covered war crimes by both sides on D-Day and during the Battle of Normandy. So you should go back and watch that for a deeper look. On D-Day, some Allied troops, especially paratroopers, were given explicit or implicit orders not to take prisoners. Naturally, the alternative to taking prisoners is executing the enemy. Cases like this continued off and on throughout the war on the Western Front. Um, often things proceeded in a tit-for-tat manner. Maybe the Germans would kill some Americans, Brits, or Canadians. Word would spread, and then the Allied troops would get their revenge. Uh, it was in response to the Malmedy massacre of American prisoners by the Waffen-SS that unofficial verbal orders were issued by some American commanders to their units to take no prisoners, among them the American 11th Armored Division, who then killed an estimated 80 German prisoners of war at the Chenon Massacre on the 1st of January 1945. It is, however, unlikely that the actual soldiers of the 11th Armored knew about Malmedy when this happened. Those events were covered up at the time, and none of the perpetrators was ever punished for it. Tarek covered that on our Instagram day by day page, and you should all be following that for his coverage of events that Sparty and I can't always devote as much time to as we'd like in our regular series. You can also find that right here on YouTube under the community tab. Anyhow, diaries kept by American troops also reveal a take no prisoners attitude in the Pacific theater. According to historian John Dower, in many instances, Japanese who did become prisoners were killed on the spot or en route to prison compounds. This, coupled with the Japanese refusal to surrender, meant that there was a much higher than usual ratio of Japanese dead compared to Japanese prisoners. It wasn't just violence against enemy soldiers either. As Sparty covered in War Against Humanity, rape was a fairly common crime committed by Allied forces in France, and that will only increase as the Allies advance further into Germany. That followed an outbreak of rape committed by French colonial soldiers in Italy and enabled by their French commanding officers. Similar events have and will continue to occur in the Pacific. Uh, troops in the Pacific also have a habit of collecting human trophies. Yes, human trophies like bits of bone and skull. This was so widespread in the Pacific theater that it was discussed in American magazines and newspapers back home. Franklin Roosevelt himself was reportedly gifted a letter opener made from a Japanese soldier's arm by a U.S. Uh, representative, a congressman, named Francis E. Walter in 1944. Roosevelt ordered that the human remains should receive a proper burial. Our next question comes from Army Captain Luke Steger. Luke asks, hello, Time Ghost team. Hello, Luke. I have a question for the Out of the Foxhole series. I know that Mexico and several other Latin American countries declared war on Germany and the Axis powers, but did they ever send any military personnel to any theaters of the war? Both Mexico and Brazil sent troops across the globe to fight the Axis powers. Mexico entered the war on May 22, 1942, 
after German torpedoes sank Mexican oil tankers in the Gulf of Mexico. More than 300 Mexicans fought in the American-trained 201st Fighter Squadron from May to August 1945. That force, known as the Aztec Eagles, conducted bombing raids against Japanese installations in the Philippines and Formosa, and also flew close air support missions for ground troops. By all accounts, they fought bravely and skillfully. Uh, about five, don't quote me on that, but about five were killed in action. Mexico also made an agreement in January 1942 with the United States under which Mexican citizens living in the U.S. could serve in the U.S. armed forces. About a thousand of them were killed in action. Um, beyond manpower, Mexico's major contribution to the war effort was the steady supply of raw materials for the American war industry. Mexico also contributed hundreds of thousands of temporary farm workers and railroad men under the Braquero Treaty to alleviate labor shortages resulting from the American draft. Brazil also stepped onto the wartime stage. We did a World War II biography special on Brazilian President Getulio Vargas a few years ago. That covered the events leading up to Brazil's entry into the war in 1942 as well. Even before Brazil entered active combat, Vargas had signed a series of lend-lease deals from 1941. Brazil was given money and equipment in exchange for the Americans being able to use Brazilian airfields. That is significant, as those bases are the closest point in the Americas to the African theater. Once Brazil entered the war, the Brazilian Navy and Brazilian Air Force fought in the Battle of the Atlantic, escorting convoys sailing between Central and South Atlantic to Gibraltar. Alone or in coordination with Allied forces, they escorted 614 convoys that protected 3,164 merchant and troop transport ships. When it comes to combat, the Brazilian Expeditionary Force was composed of around 26,000 men, including infantry, a liaison and observation flight, and a fighter squadron. Uh, known as the Smoking Snakes, like the Sabaton song, the Brazilian troops played a role in the fighting in Italy from September 1944 to May 1945. Altogether, Brazilian troops will capture some 20,000 Axis troops, including the entire German 148th Infantry Division in April. Big spoiler. Oh my god. I know you guys were thinking about the German 148th Infantry Division and how are they going to survive the war. Well, it turns out it's going to be as prisoners. Okay, for our next question... <clears throat> Time Ghost Army Brigadier Mark Steenbergen asks, could you talk about the use of posit fuses and how variable time proximity fuses changed artillery warfare? I know they were crucial for the Allies at the Battle of the Bulge. Thanks. Hi, Mark. Um, Mark is actually, uh, we know Mark in person. He was with us when we were on location in Normandy filming the D-Day series. Cool guy. Anyhow, Rick Atkinson writes in The Guns at Last Light, a GI shivering in an Ardennes foxhole asked, after his first glimpse of a German ME-262 jet streaking overhead. How come we don't ever have any secret weapons? Yet thousands of enemy troops now sensed what many American troops still did not know, that a secret weapon, no bigger than a radio tube, was being used in ground combat for the first time across the bulge, enhancing the killing power of US artillery with what one enthusiast would call the most remarkable scientific achievement of the war, except for the atomic bomb. In 1940, they estimated that two and a half thousand AA shells would have to be fired to bring down one single enemy plane. Shells then either exploded on impact or they had a timed fuse that blew up the shell after a certain flight time. Neither of these are precision methods. So they wanted to create a fuse that would know when it was near a target and then the shell would blow up when a plane was within the killing radius. Thing is, such a shell would have to withstand a lot. Being blown out of a cannon, uh, a gigantic G-force, the shell spinning hundreds of times a second, and it would also have to be simple enough to build in huge quantities and small enough to be squeezed into the nose of the shell, right? Well, they built it. They codenamed it Posit Fuse also called the VT or the T-98. The posit fuse has a little radio transmitter which sends out a signal when in flight. When that signal bounces off a solid object and returns, a receiver picks that up and trips the firing circuit and the shell explodes. 
The first plane that was brought down by a posit fuse was a Japanese one in January 1943. But they were really worried about an enemy recovering a dud and then building his own such fuses from it. So they were only fired over water or over friendly territory. Enjoying much more success than conventional shells against V-1 rocket bombs over London, for example. By late 1944, they have been developed for field artillery so that the radio signals pick up the approaching ground and they detonate like 15 or 20 meters above ground. It doesn't matter what the terrain is or what the weather conditions are, these shells can even take out entrenched enemies from above. A US Army general calls it the most important new development in the ammunition field since the introduction of high explosive projectiles. At first, Christmas Day, 1944, is the date set for the Allied armies in Western Europe to begin using the posit fuses. But the Ardennes offensive causes this to be moved up a week. The results are devastating, and the fuses are by then being mass-produced. Yes, there are drawbacks, spotter planes, um, very tall trees, chimneys they can cause detonation, and the 200,000 posit fuses fired during the Battle of the Bulge are just a fraction of the total artillery of the battle, but they are indeed the future. And to quote Atkinson again, the posit would prove as demoralizing to German troops as it was heartening to GIs. Some enemy officers called it the electroshell or the magnetic igniter, believing that terrestrial magnetism triggered the fuse. Shell fragments were said to slice through thick logs atop enemy bunkers, and a single 155mm airburst reportedly could shred every single square foot within a 75-yard diameter. Such mayhem was pure manslaughter, another German prisoner complained. The devil himself could not escape. A little, tiny, allied superweapon. Yeah, posit fuses. People don't hear about them much, right, Sparty? No. And it, it is, it is, it was, a, it was a massive, massive thing. So, uh, yeah, so remember the positive views. Thanks for the question, Mark. And with that, I will end this thrilling installment of Out of the Foxholes. If you have a question, you can ask us at community.timegoes.tv, or better yet, you can join us on Patreon at patreon.com. Patrons get priority uh, with answers to their questions, and those with the rank of captain and above get a guaranteed answer to their question. If you are generous enough to join at the highest rank, that's Brigadier, you also get access to a private WhatsApp group with all of us here at Time Ghost and all the Brigadiers. And actually, every single day, there are massive, massive discussions, of which Mark Steenbergen is a big part of most of them. So, um, yeah, you can leave your questions at the Time Ghost website or send them to us via Patreon. But you know where you should not leave them? You know the answer to that already. You should not leave them in the comments section under this video. James... James loves reading your questions, but if you leave them under the video, he will not answer them, or I will not answer them. He will be sad, and I will be, I won't be sad. I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm strong. I'm, I'm an emotionally strong character. So make sure that he has something to do and keep sending in questions at Patreon or at our website. See you next time.